Uh, for those of you who are here the first time, my life has started in October of 2006 with uh, New York Times uh, uh, war photographer, for lack of a better phrase, Moises Samon, who had been uh, taken captive during the first Iraq war. The purpose of the My Life As event is to bring news literacy and journalism course lessons to life for those of you who are in those courses, but also to offer students from any discipline, because like 95% of the news literacy students are not journalism majors, to give you a look at how somebody found their way to a career. So kind of life lessons about finding your way to a career that's not just a job. Uh, credit is granted in some courses for students who swipe their IDs. You'll do that on the way out. Uh, I'd ask you to silence your cell phones. Um, we're going to be uh, live blog, live tweeting tonight, so if you want to add to that stream, the hashtag is mylifeas, no spaces. So hashtag mylifeas. The format, just if you want to know what to expect, is a short, uh, is a speech up here on stage, and then your questions, which are really important. In fact, some of us will be watching to see if you ask questions, and you'll get a little extra credit for that. But they have to be good questions. Thank you, Professor Sanders. I did want to report one sad event today, which is that Professor Sanders, how many of you are in Professor Sanders' lecture? Oh, wow. Nicely done. Uh, Professor Sanders engaged in an Oxford-style debate today on the question, should we abolish the Electoral College? And one of the I guess not a judge, but one of the moderators and majority whips is with us tonight. And uh, Sanders lost, right? Yeah. Professor Sanders got whooped by the politically correct crowd, so we're sorry to report that. Anyway, without further ado, I'd like to introduce the Associate Dean of the School of Journalism, former Senior Vice President in charge of news gathering at CBS, Professor Marcy McGinnis. Thank you. I'm going to make this uh, really short, just like me. Um, I'm, I have the pleasure of introducing our guest speaker. Um, I also had the pleasure of hiring our guest speaker. Uh, I hired her at CBS News in 2003. And it was a decision that I certainly uh, never regretted. I can tell you that uh, the day that I met Michelle, I knew that we had a winner. We had a driven, intelligent, charming, talented reporter, anchor, correspondent. And I can tell you that she is an award-winning correspondent. She has won an Edward R. Murrow Award. She won an award for excellence from the National Association of Black Journalists. She is a role model. She is a friend. And it is my pleasure to introduce Michelle Miller. Hello, how y'all doing? I just want you to know she also made a bet that I would not come up those stairs without tripping and falling on my behind in these shoes. I am really overwhelmed. I'm impressed that in this the finals and a DJ concert, two doors over, that there's this kind of turnout. Or was this mandatory? I'm so glad you're here, really glad. Can we turn the mic down just a tad, please? Because there's a little bit of feedback. Can you all hear me okay? <sighs> I'm thrilled to be here. And I'm thrilled because this is when I get to tell a group of people that I'm living my dream. I was in the 10th grade when I heard these words. Of all the arts in which the wise excel, life's chief masterpiece is writing well. It was a 17th century philosopher who coined that phrase, and I don't know why I was drawn to it. I, I'm not into 17th century philosophers by any stretch of the imagination, but there was something about being a writer that I dug. I wasn't a very good writer, but I wanted to be. 
Fast forward to college. I go to Howard University. Third generation Howardite. Howard's an HBCU, historically black college. And I had not a clue as to what I wanted to do. Do you have friends? Do you have other people or yourself who are asking that same question? Show of hands. Do we all know what we want to be? Who we are? What, we, what career path we'd like to choose? Come on, let's, if you know, then you, you have to be loud and proud. Raise that hand. Who doesn't? You're going to be OK. Really. I figured it out by watching all of my friends. And there were friends, one of whom was a radio station newscaster at our student station. So what did I do? I went to go check out what she did because I was researching. What am I going to do with the rest of my life? And I found it. So Michelle Miller wants to be a journalist. I want to be a broadcast journalist. I look around in the School of Communications, and what do I see? There are a lot of people who want to be broadcast journalists. There are dozens of them, hundreds of them. It is like one of the most popular majors at the school. So I threw myself into it. By the time I graduated, I had worked at both radio stations. Not only the student, but we had an FM number one station with a major news department. We had the PBS affiliate that had a news magazine. We had a community newspaper, and we had a campus newspaper. I'd done two internships at newspapers, the Star Tribune in Minneapolis, the Los Angeles Times. I'd worked at ABC News Nightline, and I worked for this news feed company at the time. All of that experience, and I still couldn't find a job. This was 1989. I was scared to death, scared to death. So what did I do? Any suggestions out there? Who wants to take a guess? Raise of hands. I only need one, of, one volunteer. I did put my resume out there. Not quite then, but close. Didn't do that. I'd love to have a retail uh, job on my resume, but didn't do that. I took the money I earned over the summer when I was at the LA Times, and I flew to London and started a backpacking journey. All over Europe and North Africa. Was I crazy? Come on, I want to hear what you have to say about that. Was I crazy? I did not see a prospect in my future. I had thrown a ton of resumes out there. I had three grand in my pocket, and I always wanted to see the world. It was the best decision I made in my life. I got to work at a radio station in Nice. It was a fluke. I ran into somebody I knew. In London, I got to go to the New York Times Bureau because when I'd done a semester abroad in Kenya, Tanzania, I had met the bureau chief in Nairobi. I was offered a job in the south of France, but I figured, you know what, maybe I need to get home and see what those job prospects were because at the time, there was no internet. Snail mail was where it was. And it was thrilling because I had all of these amazing life experiences behind me. You know what happened when I got back? Any guess? No! Still couldn't find a job. But that's when I went back to the LA Times, and I started saying, I'll do anything. And because I had left good enough impression, they started feeding me these $500 gigs. $500 went a long way. Uh, 
I actually, these pieces, I told somebody I never actually wrote for the op-ed page. My pieces actually did run in the op-ed page, but it wasn't, it was like a first person interview. So it wasn't like my opinion. So I, whoever asked me that question earlier, I, I stand corrected. Um, I went to the local access station and I started doing packages for South Central Community News. I'm from South Central Los Angeles. This was right before the riots. I got to know my community in ways that I never had before. I got to cover Nelson Mandela's visit to Los Angeles when he was released from prison. I got to cover Bishop Tutu's visit. I mean, I would never have been able to do that at one of the local stations as a cub reporter. I was paid, I think, $25 a story, a package. I didn't care. It got me a tape. There's one thing I'd like to tell you guys about me, in case you haven't figured it out. I kind of like put my life out there. I kind of, uh, what comes up comes out. I'm very honest about who I am and what I do and how I feel. And so when I'm talking to a potential employer or somebody, it all comes out. And I think that's a good thing in some respects. But it's often gotten me a job. I remember interviewing with a guy by the name of Jack Hubbard, Marcy. Do you remember Jack Hubbard? He was a longtime CBSer who who gave me some advice on how bad my tape was. And I took it like a pro. I didn't get a job immediately, but I left an impression so that three months later, he called me for this fabulous opportunity working at this place called the Orange County News Channel. How many of you know about New York One? You've seen it, right? Long Island 12? Local 24-hour news. Well, they were popping up all over the place. When I got in there, one day a week I was a reporter, two days a week I was a producer, two days a week I was an assignment editor. I knew how to report, knew how to produce. The assignment editor part, never done it before in my entire life. I was the weekend assignment editor for a news operation and I had to learn on the fly. You think I was scared? You think I was scared? Heck yes, I was scared. I was so scared, I didn't know what to do. But you don't learn without pushing the envelope. From there, I went to WWL-TV. Actually, no, I went to WIS-TV in Columbia, South Carolina. I was offered a job in San Antonio and a job in Columbia. How many people would have taken the job in San Antonio? Top 40 market. They had a helicopter. <laughs> Guess where I went? I think I told you. Columbia, South Carolina, the cradle of the Confederacy. Still flew that Confederate flag atop the State House. You know how many times I had to cover that story? You know how many times I had to keep my journalistic integrity in place? We're talking about a flag that represents something that I am as a person diametrically opposed to, walking through a sea of Ku Klux Klan, Klansmen calling me G-A-R, because that's the new way you call a person something. Having a conversation with a guy who could trace his ancestry back to uh, a general in the Confederate Army, a senator on the State House floor for South Carolina, and understanding his point of view. 
That was when I realized, you know what? I'm open. I'm doing my job. I could actually understand where he was coming from in supporting his heritage. Now that's, that was like, that, that was when I really, I, I said, you know what, I've arrived in this, this field of journalism when I can be fair and, and act, you know what, I've done it. Something else happened to me in Columbia, South Carolina, I have to tell you about. Because I think it's important for people to understand that with success comes failure. Like, I failed more times than you might imagine. I had major obstacles in the road. And I, my first t the first time I was fired, well, the only time that I was fired, step on wood, was in Columbia, South Carolina. And it was involving a story and a little girl who was allegedly molested by a neighbor. And long story short, we shot it in a way where we thought we had disguised the, the identity of the mother and the child. And when it aired, people who knew her knew it was her. And she sued the station. Um, and so the producer of the show, myself and the photographer, as a part of the settlement, we were all fired. At the time, I was looking for a job even before, because my boss was someone who told me I would never make it in the business, that I didn't have what it took, I couldn't write worth a damn. He'd also told Brian Williams that sometime when he did work with him in Philadelphia. So like, I actually feel like vindicated now, but you know who Brian Williams is, right? Well, that's good, because you know who Scott Pelley is, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, Brian Williams is the anchor for the, for the NBC Nightly News. Scott Pelley is the anchor for the fabulous news that is the CBS Evening News. But I just wanted to kind of point that out to you, that he's doing all right, right? So I had been in New Orleans the day before I was fired, interviewing with a guy by the name of Joe Duke. Asked him a question in the interview. Have you ever made a mistake? He told me what his mistake was. He turns to me, looks back, he says, have you? And in a way that I am open and honest, I went on to explain what had happened without giving away any of the pertinent details because it was a lawsuit and there was confidentiality issues. But I basically told on myself. I leave, I go back, I'm summarily dismissed in my boss's office. What was actually also vindicating was at the same time that he was firing me, he was crying, and so was the human resources person. So I said, at least they feel good about firing me. I mean, feel bad about firing me. Um, <laughs> um, and I just took off for Mexico. Because I'd always wanted to see Mexico, and you know, I needed to exhale, right? That's what I do. I like go travel in my stressful times. And Joe Duke tried to call me at the station. And guess what? I wasn't there. I no longer work there. He finally got in touch with me. He asked Michelle, what happened? I said, uh, well, you remember that story I told you about? And he was like, yeah. That's what happened. He's like, oh, give me two days. I'll let you know if I want to offer you this job. He called me back and he said, Michelle, I like, your, I like your attitude. I like your honesty. And I know one thing, you'll never make that mistake again. And he hired me. Now let me tell you about WWL. There are two things I owe WWL for. One, giving me a new lease on life in my career and introducing me to my husband. Oh! The romantics in the audience. So, uh, we're gonna get back to Joe Duke in a moment. I go to WWL, I'm a weekend anchor and a reporter during the week. 
One of my first assignments was to go down to City Hall and cover some, like, press conference the mayor was having. Um, I go down. The mayor's, like, 35 minutes late. I'm talking to another reporter. And in he walks. And I'm still talking. And he looks at me and he says, <clears throat> Really? You're talking to me? And you're 40 minutes late? I didn't say that, but that's the look on my face. <laughs> and I guess that sparked something. Also, not for me, but I think it sparked something for him because I had a little sass. And I also lean on him when I was questioning him about certain things. There was even one story Marcy remembers hearing from Joe Duke that I swear I forgot, don't know why, but there's like this urban legend that I followed him into the men's room questioning him with a camera. I, I could never do that. Do you think I could do something like that? Yeah. <laughs> he wooed me, wooed, 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 wooed. But there's a problem, right? OK? So before it got to the point where, like it got to the point, I had sort of backed off from, so like we'd have sort of this situation in the newsroom where we'd ask, you know, it's like, oh, well, we have this thing going on in the mayor's office. Who wants to cover it? Because nobody was really on the city hall beat. So I just kind of like never said anything. I never volunteer for those stories. And then when Mark like wanted to officially date me, like go out on a date, because what would happen is I started using him as a source. This is how I got to know him. And when he asked me out on a date, I was actually dating another person at the time. And I kept telling him, you know, I like you. You know, you're cool, right? But I'm dating this other person. And, um, but I knew that at that point, like there, that was the line. Like the guy likes me, right? And okay, I think I'm like, the fact that I'm even there having the discussion says I, I can't go there. So I backed off. Then I told him he wanted to take me out like on a date. I said, OK, I got to do something. I got to go tell my boss, right? My boss was 80 years old. <laughs> very, very brilliant man who was like one of those pillars in New Orleans. And walking up to his office scared the bejesus out of me. I was terrified. But I knew I had to do it. So I walked up to his office. I told him, sir, I need to take you into my confidence. I'd like to start dating someone. I think it might be a problem. And he said, would that someone be the mayor? <laughs> I was like, uh, yeah. He was like, if and when it becomes a problem, we will let you know. <laughs> I said, OK. Can we keep this between us? Yes, Ms. Miller, we certainly can. <laughs> now, I did that because, and maybe I'm going a little too in the personal realm, but, but I have to tell people this because it, it, you know, this is what set my like, parameters of understanding what conflicts of interest were. I mean, I have like a super, super duper like, understanding of like, conflicts and, and what they are. And this established it for me. And um, at the same time, what if he dumped me next week? You know? Why would I want all of my newsroom colleagues to know that? So for about two months, I think we dated, you know, in quiet. But my, well, I wasn't covering him. My boss knew about it. Anybody have a problem with that? Any of you longtime journalists have a problem with that? <laughs> Dean? My publisher ran for first job. So. Oh. I know about it. Good. 
Lo and behold, four years later, I marry the guy. And <laughs> which presented itself a whole new set of issues because then I was anchor, reporter, and first lady. But New York City knows all about that, right? Donna Hanover, Rudy Giuliani. Oh, you guys weren't even born then, right? You were babies. Well, happy to say that, you know, my relationship is still in good standing. I thought my career was going to end in New Orleans for obvious reasons. Married a hometown boy. So, I, you know what I did? I, I went back to school. Right? I went got my master's because I wanted to, if I couldn't practice the profession, I wanted to teach the profession. But I knew about journalism, so I didn't want a journalism degree because I wanted an expertise someplace else. So where did I get my master's in? Or what did I get my master's in? Ooh, someone did her homework. Urban studies, which was fascinating. I went on to like try and get my PhD over at Tulane and then I got pregnant and couldn't do that, but I taught at Dillard University. So I was working like 4 a.m. to noon and then I had three, two classes, two or three classes a week um, where I taught journalism and writing. I was a busy girl, but I knew I had to start sowing the seeds. I'm going back over to my cheat sheet because, ah, okay. So I'm set, I have my master's degree in hand, I'm still working in the profession. I'm more an anchor now because now I moved from Monday through Friday, four to seven in the morning, I'm anchoring a show, four to six in the morning, five to six in the morning, anchoring a show, and um, I do some stories, um, but I'm not really honing my skills as a reporter. I'm an anchor, right? Um, and I thought, you know what? I better resign myself to, to living in New Orleans. My husband's not going anywhere. He's not mayor anymore. He's a lawyer for a year, and then he gets a job in New York City. My dream city, okay? <laughs> like, how does that happen, right? So I come up here, and I throw a wide net. I cast a net out there, and I talk to everybody. Friends in the business, sisters, cousins who I met, I'd gone to the Pointer Institute and I met a lovely man by the name of Byron Pitts, who was a CBS News correspondent. And he told me, come on over to CBS. I want to introduce you to somebody. And he introduced me to Marcy McGinnis. The same day, I was visiting another guy. Want to guess who he is? The guy who was in charge of hiring for CBS NewsPass was indeed. <laughs> no, I'll give you a hint. I said his name before. The guy who hired me in New Orleans, the first round, Joe Duke. See how that like integrity thing like works out in my favor, telling the truth and being upfront and honest and having it like go-getter attitude and, you know. I, I mean, I could stand here and talk about the journalistic science of what we do, but I think it's important for you to understand that the ethics of who you are and what you bring as a person to the profession are just as equally as important because they've helped bring me here in many ways, I, I say to people all the time, there are much, far more talented people out there, better writers than I am, deeper voices than I have. They can speak four more languages than I do. 
But there was something about me, and I say this in the most humblest of ways, that spoke to the heart of the people who were trusting me with that spot. Does that make sense? When Marcy hired me, I was basically an anchor who had done some reporting. She saw something. I don't know what it was, but it was something. I'm sure Joe Duke's recommendation helped. I'm sure Byron Pitt's recommendation helped. There were a couple other people whose recommendations she also leaned on. It certainly wasn't my writing. I was an okay writer, but I was not a network level correspondent writer. A lot of us aren't quite there, even when we get there. That was a tough time. So I get to CBS News, the big time. I'm there a year, and I'm in a place called Newspath, and I'm working for BT Nightly News. It was a half hour long uh, news program that CBS produced. For BET. I was the national correspondent. It was fantastic. It's my entree to New York City and the national beat for a national newscast. It was great. Then they folded the, the show. And I walked over to Newspath in the Northeast Bureau, which is like the bureau in New York. I was five months pregnant when Katrina hit New Orleans. You imagine, um, no one really knows me over at CBS News, except for Pat Shevlin, who was the executive producer of The Weeknd. And she knew my background, so she knew that I knew what I was talking about when I told her, you know what, this storm really, it's not gonna, it's not gonna turn. It's going to hit New Orleans, and it's going to hit New Orleans this way. And let me tell you what's going to happen, right? Can you imagine knowing how it was going to, what was about to happen, and people up north didn't get it. I mean, you understand now after Hurricane Sandy, but like, you don't understand, unless you've been in a hurricane, you don't get it, right? So... I'm five months pregnant. There's no way they're sending me to New Orleans. But I was like, send me somewhere where I can help. Please. A week I'm shouting. Please send me somewhere. No, we're not sending you anywhere. The following week, the people were being bused to Houston. Do you guys remember any of this? They were evacuated to Houston. And that's when they sent me down. And that's when I was able to sort of get my feet wet with the net network. I had a level of expertise. I knew New Orleans people, and I knew how completely disassociated they would be outside of their hometown. Because, I mean, people there live and breathe it. So, like, if there's something I understand, I understood the culture, right? Did some good stories. I come back. I go on maternity leave. Marcy leaves CBS News. A whole new crop of people come in. Wasn't altogether sure I was their cup of tea. What did I do? Any questions? Any suggestions? Any? No? I dug deep, and I said, if there's something I'm not doing right, you tell me. Don't let me fail. I'm like, I went to them. If I'm not doing something right, it is your job to tell me. And I'm willing to get better. You just show me what it is you want me to do. 
sort of like, they're used to people saying, I guess, I'm all right the way I am. What's wrong with me? I think there's a lesson there as young people, because I was still young. It has been a long, arduous struggle at CBS News. I would not trade it for the world, because I have learned so, 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 so much. I have learned to stand up for myself. I've learned to talk about my work to my colleagues because they've been some of the best teachers, my producers, some of the interns who go out on stories with me make me a better reporter. The APs, I listen to everybody, don't I? She went out on a story with me this summer. But I'm very open to always learning and always growing. If you were to ask me like, what I think my best skill is, I would have to say it is interviewing people and getting them to open up. It is, bar none, the one thing that I think that I do best. And I think, I think it shows in the pieces I do. So I want to show you some pieces I've done. And you be the judge. Two of them are hurricane stories. Um, there were tons of hurricane stories, tons of them. It was a story that is still going on. How do you tell a story that's going to matter to people who have seen it day in and day out, right? How do you tell the big picture through single eyes? How do you relate to somebody and like zoom in and connect with the audience? Let's, let's see if I accomplish that. Back now from Breezy Point, New York. We've been watching a somber procession here all day and into the evening. People returning to what is left of their homes, looking for cherished possessions. Michelle Miller helped one woman find a little comfort. In the middle of dust and ashes, we found a pair of flip-flops worn by a 71-year-old widow named Marie Lapristi. Lapristi was digging through what's left of 7 Gotham Lane, her home of 34 years. What are you hoping to find? Something, something I could take with me. When the flames started late Monday night, LaPriesti was in her house with two neighbors, fellow widows Kathy Brennan and Elaine Atasso. And we thought we could fight it. The worst thing that water comes up, but at least we would have everything we own. <laughs> but then the fire started coming and we couldn't fight that. They sought refuge in a neighbor's house. When that caught fire, they fled to another. This is what's left of the first home. This was the second. All lost. They finally found refuge at a church. Oh my God. <laughs> Every few minutes, a neighbor greeted her with a hug. The community spirit is strong. You the baby. Oh, baby. Like most of her neighbors here, LaPriesti says she's not going anywhere. I want to be here. <laughs> Why do you want to stay here? Because. I belong in Breezy. This is our community. LaPriesti continued to dig through the rubble of her home, determined to find something, anything, to ease the pain. Just the tile. I had tile. Her determination was contagious. I think I found something over here. One small memory <laughs> Thank you. from a life blown apart by a terrible storm. Michelle Miller, CBS News, Breezy Point, New York.
To give you a better idea of how many New Yorkers were left in the dark by Sandy, have a look at this. Here's the city's skyline before the storm. And this is how it looked after the lights went out in lower Manhattan. The blackout left an untold number of elderly and disabled folks stranded in high-rise apartment buildings. Michelle Miller found New Yorkers are stepping up to help them. In the dark and narrow staircase of Lower Manhattan Seward Park apartment complex, we heard the echo of Nick Caswell's footsteps. Three, four, five, six. To make his way through, the 62-year-old counts every step. You gotta slow down for us, buddy. Hold up, Nick. Seward lost power Monday night, plunging 4,000 residents into darkness. Since then, Caswell has been the only lifeline to the outside world for at least seven families. Today, he was headed to the 20th floor. Well, we've got a message to try and help this, these people, whoever they are. Thank you. He first stopped to visit 92-year-old Lily Lifflander. She lives on floor 16. If people hadn't been helping you, would you, would you be? I feel stranded. Seven, eight, nine, ten. Caswell finally got to apartment 2006. How you doing? I was recruited by the building to see what you need. Elaine Brody and Mark Hens were the couple behind the door. We really felt uh, isolated. So when folks knocked on the door, what was your first thought? Uh, gratefulness. Yes. <laughs> Even if you just came to say hello, how are you? The couple hasn't been outside since the elevator yeah, stopped running awesome. Monday night. Yes. Coming up is really a hardship yeah, for us. So you know, stayed up here. We stayed up here and we knew it would be a commitment to walk down because we wouldn't be coming back up. Yeah. Three days without a working water. fridge yeah. and the cupboard Jeez, is almost bare. So Caswell heads back to the stairwell, out the front door, and to the food distribution center two buildings over. Please and thank you, that's what I want in life, that's all. It's yeah. a nice thing. So it's back up the stairs. Oh, oh, wow. To the people who depend on him. We appreciate that. that. Michelle Miller, CBS News, oh, wow. New York. Thank, thank you, so thank you. So, like a little story, it's like a little one person story. It's like finding the one story as opposed to telling five people's point of view. Would, would, have you, would you have gotten the same sense if it had been one of these stories with like five or six different people in it telling you, yeah, I went to go take, you know, some groceries up to the person on floor five? Another person saying, yeah, you know, I made sure that they had the medicine on floor seven. I don't know. I just thought, you know, it was, it was a way to do it differently. And I'm always looking for ways to do things differently. Um, I want to tell you about um, this other story that I did. I think it's an example of like informing the public of something maybe they, they don't know. It's one of these it's one of these stories it's hard to tell because unless you're going through it, you have absolutely no idea what it's like. And because it involves veterans, I think sometimes we, we, we close our ears off to it because quite frankly, we're, we're fatigued by war. But I thought it was important, so I, I wanted to tell people about it. We want to close this broadcast tonight by noting the sacrifices made by servicemen and women and those sacrifices made by their families who also bear scars of war. Here's Michelle Miller. The guy that came back from Iraq was not at all the guy that left. Brandon Vine's husband, her high school sweetheart, was once the man she leaned on when times were tough. That all changed after Caleb returned from two deployments in Iraq. Caleb was injured in multiple IED explosions. He was not only dealing with PTSD, but he was also dealing with traumatic brain injury, which very much changes somebody's personality. And changes the person caring for them. Absolutely, absolutely. 
Since 2007, Vines has been Caleb's sole caretaker, dealing with her husband's night tremors, erratic mood swings, and the physical injuries that have left him permanently disabled. At the same time, she's trying to shield her six-year-old daughter. Vine says it's left her with scars of her own. I was having nightmares about Iraq, a place I've never been, a place I've never, you know, other than in pictures and that kind of thing. I got to where I didn't like crowded places, just like my husband. Um, it was all these sorts of things where literally I was almost mirroring his behavior. Brandon's behavior has been recognized by the Department of Veterans Affairs as secondary post-traumatic stress disorder. Deborah Amder runs the VA's program, which provides mental health services to caregivers. Although they didn't experience that initial trauma that injured the veteran, they are experiencing that trauma through being exposed to what the veteran has endured. Already, 6,000 caregivers have contacted the VA for help. It's us helping each other. Vines invited us to meet some who she met through the nonprofit she started five years ago called Family of a Vet, which provides education and resources to caregivers. It impacts the whole family. Kat Honaker cares for her husband, who was injured in Iraq in 2006. I had to pull the gun out of my husband's mouth. And for two years now, he has blamed me every single day for saving his life. Tori Shannon's husband suffered a head injury in 2004. I struggle because I feel like I'm not doing enough or I'm not doing everything the way I should be doing. I am a very strong and capable person who is of sound mind, but twice I tried to commit suicide. Through their shared struggles, these women are helping each other cope. Where do you go from here? We keep going. You know, it's all about learning new ways to handle it and figuring out how to stay together as a family. For these military families, the road to recovery is taking it one day at a time. Michelle Miller, CBS News, Daphne, Alabama. The last piece I want to show you, I know we're running out of time because we want to ask some questions, but I, I really, I'm a history buff. I mentioned that before. So important for us to know where we've been so we don't make the same mistakes that we've made. 22 years ago, New York City made a rush to judgment and it forever changed the lives of five young men. Here's their story. It was a horrific crime, a jogger beaten, raped and left for dead in New York Central Park. Five teenagers were tried, convicted and sent to prison. The problem, they weren't guilty. Michelle Miller spoke with two of them and tells the story of a documentary that was released this weekend. In April 1989, a 28-year-old white female jogger was raped, beaten, and left for dead in Central Park. The NYPD quickly accused five teenagers who were in the park that night. Four were black, one was Hispanic. Suspect Yusuf Salam was 15 at the time. The narrative that they sold the public was completely false. It was a case built on false confessions, but the story of interracial gang rape gripped a city whose crime rate had soared. They wanted to solve this case so quickly that they felt like the story of the five sound much, much better than there being one person. Suspect Raymond Santana was 14. Help us understand why you confessed. We were 14, 15, 16 year olds um, who had never been involved with the law, who had never had a criminal record, who were very naive. And then you add in no food, no drink, no water, no sleep. And, um, and then you throw in the, the number one ingredient is pressure. But their statements were inconsistent. There were no witnesses and no DNA evidence against the five. The jogger had no memory of the attack. Still, two trial juries convicted them all. Salam, Santana, and two other juveniles served seven years. A fifth defendant served 13. There wasn't enough skepticism. People weren't asking the right questions. Sarah Burns produced and directed a new film called The Central Park Five. She had help from her father, renowned documentarian Ken Burns, and her filmmaker husband, David McMahon. This is about these five men who were children and who were completely dehumanized. 
They had no voice. They were treated as animals. In 2002, after 13 years, an incarcerated serial rapist and murderer came forward with a true confession in the jogger attack, corroborated by DNA evidence. Courts agreed to throw out the convictions of the Central Park Five. Our records have been wiped clean, but the indelible scar of going to prison is still there. They were once registered sexual predators who couldn't get a job. Now 38, Salam and Santana both work for hospitals and are fathers. I don't know, you know, what will be in my future. Got to put one step forward and move on. A lawsuit against the police and prosecutors behind their wrongful convictions is pending. But they say no amount of money could give them back the years they lost. Michelle Miller, CBS News, New York. The civil lawsuit that's been filed itself has become part of the story. New York City wants the filmmakers to turn over their raw interviews. They refused, citing their rights as journalists to protect their sources. And what was so telling about that story is one of my colleagues, um, who's an avid jogger, who's an avid jogger, says, yeah, she, every time she jogs by Central Park, she thinks about that woman, and she thinks... One of the boys who was killed, 16 year old Andy And, and she, she, she says, I think about that case all the time. She said, but I never, after all the press it got, she never realized those five kids, now adults, had been exonerated. Never. So all the press, all the media that vilified these young men, I mean, in covering what was happening in terms of um, what the prosecutors were doing and the op-ed pages and so on and so forth. I didn't live here. I lived all the way in Los Angeles, and I remember this case vividly. The same was not done when the exoneration happened. It didn't erase the memory of what had happened. You know, I mean, I, I, that's chilling to me that these guys are still fighting for their reputation. Can you imagine it could happen to you? A forced confession. We're seeing prosecutorial misconduct happening every single day. You don't think it could happen to you? It doesn't matter if you're white, black, yellow, or brown. It can happen to you. Young men and women are being wrongfully convicted and forced into coercion, and you need to know what your rights are, and you need to know now. That's why I did the story. Um, do we have time for that last piece? Okay, I just wanna say this last piece was a story that um, ran last March, um, at last February, about a shooting in Chardon, Ohio. This was before the war shooting, obviously in the movie theater, but this was a kid who shot five of his five other kids at this high school. Do you guys remember hearing about that? Um, in terms of storytelling, you hear my voice in all of these pieces. That's voice over video. It's a package, what we call a package, for those of you who don't know the technical jargon. But because these people were telling their story and it was so compelling, my senior staff said, hey, why don't we tell the story differently and just let them talk for themselves? So this is how we put this story together. One of the boys who was killed, 16-year-old Danny Parmeter, was the middle child in his family. He had an older brother and younger sister. He studied computer science, and his parents say that there was no question that he couldn't answer. Michelle Miller spoke with Danny's mother and father, Dina and Bob Parmeter today, and Danny's older brother, Dominic. They told Michelle that they wanted a chance to talk about Danny. When the Parmeters sat down for the interview, they were wearing Danny's clothes. Mrs. Parmeter is a nurse, and she says she heard about the shooting while driving home from the night shift. And I turned on the radio, and they were talking about it, and I... I had a sick feeling in my stomach. I didn't know why, and I, I did. I really did, and I was scared for him. I don't know why. I just tried to call him. Nothing. He didn't answer, and I left a message. Daddy, it's Mom. Call me back. 
It was a call, and it had Danny's picture on it on my cell phone, so I said, oh, he's calling me. It was commotion, and it was some Kirtland fire chief or something, I don't know. And he said, Danny is being life flighted to Metro Hospital right now. You have to go to Metro. I said, I want to talk to him. Let me talk to him. Well, they're still doing CPR on him. <laughs> he has two tons throat. It's bloody. We were yelling at him to fight. 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 Right. He tried. He did. He tried. He did. He said, Don't go, Danny. Don't go. They died. Don't. Don't go, Danny. Love you today. Fight. But he, uh, he fought. just didn't have no brain waves left. Would you ever have imagined being in a funeral home, planning his funeral? Think about coming to a funeral home, picking out a casket, what is that? Picking out a casket for your son? You were supposed to go and pick out colleges. You were supposed to go visit Ohio State next month. I'm mad now, I'm mad. I know my life will never be the same again. No. I will get better, but right now, I'll never be, there'll always be something missing. How do you want your son to be remembered? He's a funny, mm -hmm. lovable kid that will help you with anything. He was just 16. He was 16 years old. <laughs> he didn't get to live his life. He was taken. He didn't do anything to anybody. Never he just didn't deserve it. The family of Danny Parmeter with Michelle Miller. So now I think is the time when you get to grill me. Any questions? Uh oh. You mean with a fake voice? <laughs> what do you mean? You mean like... You were like, um, uh, this building was built by the stuff. Like, that, this is the first building. Like, you know, uh, <laughs> Marcy, why do we talk like that? <laughs> we're all trying to train in this reporter voice. Thing. Yes. It's, it's kind of, um, you know, sometimes we go to voice coaches and they... I think we're... I think I'm part of the last breed of people who talk like that. Sort of? Probably not. <laughs> Although you went through many obstacles um, through your career, when did you finally feel settled? At what I still don't feel, years? I do not feel settled now. I was telling someone um, that, you know, when I was in college, she says, what would you tell your younger self? And I said, I would tell my younger self that you were never settled that you were, it is always a struggle that no matter what level of success that you've reached, can you like exhale and say, I have arrived. I mean, you can say, I've arrived, but I gotta keep marching on that mountain, you know, I gotta keep. How old were you when all this started? Transforming into your career. Okay, so, so I was, so by the time I was 22, I had a, I had a job, so, you know, I started, you know, at that Orange County News Channel, and then I went to Columbia, South Carolina when I was like 26 or 27, and then I went to uh, WWL when I was 28 or 29, and then I went to CBS when I was like 32 or 33. So, I mean, I've been employed, I've been fired, but I fortunately, you know, was able to kind of get back on the bandwagon and stay employed. Um, is there a, a recent news story that uh, you wish you could have covered in the past year or so? In the last year? Yeah. Um, 
There are two, actually. The Aurora shooting, and then it was the shooting of the congresswoman down in, um, um, yeah. And I really Arizona. wanted to go on that junket that Seth Doan got to go on covering the royals all throughout Southeast Asia, but you know, that one didn't come my way. No, yeah, those would be the three. That was a plum assignment, I tell you. Here's one. obstacles and throughout your journalism career, and you said you applied to jobs and a lot of them weren't getting back to you. What made you kept on going? Why would you not give up? Um, because um, I think, you know, I think, I mean, you, you have parents or loved ones who have always told you, just don't quit. My dad used to remember, it was this like, in, there was like, you know, like you've heard of that, that poem, Invictus, right? There was some other poem I, my dad used to always re recite, and he said, it was the, the last line of it was, just don't quit. Just don't, and like, I can't memorize, I need to go back and find that, but my father was never a quitter. My, fa my grandmother, you have to understand the, my history. My grandmother graduated from college in 1916. She was an African-American woman from Dallas, Texas, who traveled to Washington, D.C. to go to college in 1912 by herself, who then married, helped her husband get his master's degree in Boston. They moved to East St. Louis and raised two kids and sent their two kids to college and a third neighbor they paid for to go to college. That neighbor became one of the leading surgeons in the country, and so did my father. My father went to the South to get his training. I remember the first time I went and I asked him after I'd been at college and I learned about the black diaspora, because you know they don't really teach or they hadn't taught African American history the way they should in school. And I said, Daddy, did anyone ever call you the N-word? And he's like, sure, all the time. It's like, Daddy, what did you do? He looked at me in the most stern voice, and, and, and he said to me, I did absolutely nothing. Because I had a goal, and I was not going to let anybody deter me from it. So if my father and my grandmother can withstand the level of racism, pushback, and BS that they dealt with throughout their entire lives, surely I could overcome somebody telling me I wasn't going to make it in the business. We don't have a job for you. I mean, that's like, we have it easy. And in every single one of us, whether you're black or Hispanic or white, you know what? We have it easier than our parents did. I'm sure you can go back in the histories of your family and figure that out as well. You know what I'm saying? Everybody has a story that's similar to the one that I told in some way, shape, or form. You dig deep and you keep moving forward. Um, first of all, thank you very much for doing this. Oh, thank you. And um, I had a question. Earlier you said that you were very open to, um, well, always looking for ways to do things differently. Mm -hmm. Could you give us any very recent um, examples of you know, trying something new or doing something different in your journalism or reporting? Well, um, the, the Marie Lapriste hurricane piece, the one with the lady in the plate, that was different um, in that, like, I really struggled with, like, because, you know, I'm, I'm, like, in there with her. I mean, usually we tell a story and the, the, the correspondent's not in the story. You're telling the story. So I, was, I, really, I really struggled with this story because I kept saying to myself, you're in it, you're making the story, you're in it, you're in it. But it wasn't like, I, I, you know, we don't want to stage something. But in the course of following her through her story, she like sort of engaged me. I mean, she was about to fall into that. You saw what she was stepping, and I, the day before, I was telling someone the day before, I was at that location doing a story, and I was walking around like she was, and literally fell into, it wasn't quite this high, but like a crevice into like 
like a foot of water and, and like cut my hand. I had to have a tetanus shot. So it was fresh on my mind this woman could get hurt. So that's why you kind of saw me like, <laughs> so, but I was struggling with that, right? And I was struggling with like everything. I said, okay, I'm in the peace. She wants me to turn this over. You saw how she was pointing. She said, go get that. And, and then when I saw the plate, I was like, oh gosh, how do I do this? And I can't stage it. So however it happened had to happen. So I saw it, so I had to be the one to say, hey, I think I've, so I mean, that was a whole different experience for me. And fortunately, it worked out and people, I mean, it was a fine line, right? It was a really fine line and I struggled with it, but it's like one of those times where it like, you know, it happens and it makes sense. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, hi. Hi. Thank you for coming. And Thank you. So You're so polite. <laughs> I love this. Um, I'm wondering when you're doing, especially these stories that have very like sad stories, uh, sad backgrounds to them. How do you, how do you play that line between being this very separate reporter and being this friendly, open woman who like is like curious about their bodies and, and sort of wants to be their friend? Like, how do you, how do you make them understand? See, I, I, on, this, on this hurricane piece, I mean, on the hurricane stories, I think I failed miserably. There was just no way not to be touched by, the, I, I remember one of my favorite correspondents, Lee Cowan, during the, during the Hurricane Katrina situation, he went around in a boat and there was a, um, he found a guy who was stranded in a flooded area after being in the hospital. So all he had was the hospital robe on, you know, the one where you can see the, yeah. And um, he pulled him into the boat. And you could tell, I mean, he was just absolutely wrecked by it. Do you remember that piece? I so remember that piece. And you know what? We're human beings too, we feel. I mean, I don't know if you saw there, like, I'm so glad the cameraman zoomed in because I literally started crying. I was like this close to just, she, when she broke down, I broke down. I, there, sometimes you can't, there is, you feel. You just do. Now, would I have cried if, you know, Barack Obama had lost? Was, was, would that be crossing the line in the middle of it? Yeah. You know, or if I were a Romney, you know, uh, supporter, would, would I have, like, you know, been up in arms, like, he lost, oh my gosh, I can't believe, you know, no, that's, that's really crossing the line. But in these situations when, like, the entire world is feeling horrible about what's happened, I think they're gonna cut me a break, right? I, I, I like, I'm asking like the, the veteran CBS Newsers because even Walter Cronkite had his moment when John F. Kennedy was pronounced dead. He took those glasses off, he looked up at the clock and he had a sniffle and a sigh and a wipe of a tear. And you can't get any better than John, Walter Cronkite. So you know, I cut myself a break. Okay, we have time for just two more. Hi, um, thank you for giving us this lecture. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, I would like to know what experience you had while traveling through Europe made it the best decision of your life. Oh, okay. So I should probably say that was the best decision of my life up to that time. But it's still one of those decisions. Like I, my travel, my travel abroad experiences, I still am living off of, like that feeling of complete openness to learning. Um, and because you're living day by day, I had no schedule. There was no schedule that was telling me to, so I think I was living literally on the edge every single day. And I was traveling by myself. So there was that air of like unknowing what was gonna happen to me. I'll never forget I was in Florence, Italy. I woke up in the middle of the night and I just started crying like a baby. 
And Fiona Fagan, an Aussie I was traveling with, that you just meet people and it's like you've known the rest of your life, for your entire lives, and she and I, she just came to visit me about three weeks ago. She said to me, why are you crying? And I said, because I know that when I go back, I will never feel this alive ever again. And I've been trying to recapture that feeling because I felt it in Kenya, I felt it in Australia, and through my travels in you know, Southeast Asia, um, throughout my travels in North Africa. When that, it was like this feeling of being alive. Like every single one of you should have that experience. I don't know what gets you there, hopefully, Drugs aren't a part of it, alcohol's not a part of it, but there is like when you are in the moment, the moment, the moment. Do you know what I'm talking about? Being in the moment? It's a drug. And so I still remember that feeling and I want to recapture it. And so that's part of it because every experience was new to me. And that's why I love my job because every day is different. And I, it's kind of like an adrenaline junkie trying to catch that next fix. Okay. Our last fix. <laughs> you know, um, I'm a writer for the Mina Web Series story group. Uh-huh. Uh, this, this evening, or later on, the beginning of the day today, Palestinians had their statehood uh, upgraded in the EU translation. I heard something about that. I was, I was on my way out here. I wasn't watching. Yeah, go ahead. Eight days ago. Yes. There was the ceasefire between Israeli right. government and the Palestinian government. Um, but here in New York, the main, most mainstream news decided to show instead images of um, Palestinian uh, Hamas leaders um, on a bike driving the, bringing a uh, Israeli spy on the floor and then dragging him on the floor mm -hmm. instead of emphasizing the fact that over 100 Palestinians had died. So do you think, because of the American uh, political stance towards Israel, do you think mainstream media in America is a bit too heavy on the Israeli side? Okay, you want to get me in trouble now, don't you? <laughs> okay, I will say this. I will say that, because um, I have discussions with a friend of mine, a very dear friend of mine who um, was one of the bureau producers in Tel Aviv and she is a Zionist to her heart. Um, and I just think that there is, you can't win on this issue. From the point that they rejected Ralph K. Bunch's agreement for two separate states, there was gonna be a problem. And, um, you know, I, I don't think I'm the person, I mean, you can be, I think every single person in here is gonna judge for themselves based on if they're as red in as you are. Um, I have my opinion. I don't think it's wise of me to share it. Um, but I, I will tell you that, you know, everyone's gonna see it the way they're gonna see it based on their particular set of cir circumstances and perspectives. You know, and, and don't think, there's one thing I want to leave with you, it's this. You know, none of you were born nine pound, eight ounce journalists. Not a single one of you, okay? Remember you were born the person you are from the parents who spawned you. <laughs> you know, you grew up in their household you have seen things that no one else has seen. And that is what colors and gives you like the difference that makes you who you are. And there is nothing wrong with being different. There is nothing wrong with being or having an opinion. Understand that you are not objective as journalists. You are not. I don't care what anybody says. You have an opinion. Can you step outside of that opinion and be fair and accurate in your reporting. That is what you are seeking. You are seeking the higher order of objectivity, fairness, and accuracy. You are not, I'm sorry if you disagree with me on this, but that's just how I feel. No one is objective. They just aren't. 
Can they step outside of themselves and be fair in how they report a story? Can they pursue objectivity? Yes. But understand that. And be proud that you, know, you are who you are outside of the profession because you as people are what make you human beings, not the title of the profession that you pursue. Okay, join me please in thanking Michelle for coming here. Thank you. Thank you.